Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Now let me welcome Gargi Gupta, PhD student, talk about her research field of explainable AI. Come on, share your screen, please, Gupta, with us. Hi, good evening, everyone. For everyone who's there in person and who's there attending the session online today. So today I'll be talking about demystifying the concepts of explainable AI and I'll walk through my PhD journey and what I'm doing with um, all these days and I'm currently in my second year of my PhD so I'll just take a moment and share my screen so before starting let me give an introduction about myself. I'm currently enrolled in second year of PhD and I'm working with the SFI Center for Machine Learning and I'm associated with TU Dublin and I am supervised by Dr. Luca Longo and my research interests are I work in explainable AI. Previously, I have worked for machine learning for climate and health and I'm also, I have also worked with machine learning for satellite images. And in past, I was serving as assistant professor at a university in India. And I was also a research intern at the remote sensing lab at IIT Roorkee, India. So this is just a brief overview. And today I'm here with you all. So let's take an overview of the talk. So today I'll be discussing with you the basic concepts of explainable AI, the case studies, the need and role of explainable AI, interpretability versus explainability, the XAI and industry landscape, and I'll walk through my the PhD research, right? So let's start. Let's start with the basic case study. Let's say we have, I think in our chat, we, I saw someone is, someone Sara is there. So let's say Sara applies for loan application, right? Now, bank, passes her loan model and application through an ML model. And what happens is that the, the Sarah's loan application was rejected. But the point is, Sarah says that she had good credit score. She had a good financial background and she has better transactions over the number of years. But still, her loan application was rejected. Now, Sarah, as an end user, couldn't comprehend that why her application was rejected. And when she went to the bank and asked, why was my application rejected? The bank couldn't answer Sarah anything because the bank was passing all her data, all her things through an ML model. And ML model was, was making decision and telling that whether the loan application was accepted or rejected. So here comes the role of explainable AI. Now, when we add a more interface or we add an additional interface along with the learning model, a more, an interface of explainability, that would help or let Sarah know that why exactly her bank loan application was rejected. So this is a very basic example case study that I always use to explain the concept. Now we'll go further and go into the more details, right? Now let us look at this image here. So in the first part of the image, you can see it just shows us the basic workflow of the ML models or ML project that you go through. So there are at times many situations that whenever you as an end user, you get a result, you may feel confused that why such error happened, why the model was doing this, why you got a result. So in order to question all these things, we add one more interface along with the learning process called as the interface of explainability, right? So when this additional interface is added along with your learning process, you as an end user, would be able to understand why the solution was working, why not it was working, and how can you trust it, right? Now, you may say that end users may of, be of different kind, they may have different knowledge domains. I agree on that part. 
but I'm not going to the details of the end users right now. That is completely different domain because the explainable uh, explanation that you're getting from the model may also depend upon the type of the end user. So some end users may be expert user who are already aware of the hyperparameters or the parameters that are passed into the model. And there may be some layman users who are generally concerned about the output of the application, not with the inner working. So right now we are just learning that we add an additional interface along with the learning process that is an explainable interface to help us understand that why certain decisions were made. So in order to summarize so that you remember this part always in your life, explainable AI or explainable artificial intelligence is a set of processes and methods that allows human users to comprehend and trust the results and the output created by the machine learning algorithms. I think this was pretty much clear with the uh, case studies and the image shown above in the previous slide, right? So we can also say that the explainable AI helps us to characterize the model accuracy, the fairness, the transparency and the outcomes in the AI powered decision making by the models, right? I hope the basic definition is clear to everyone right now or what I'm gonna talk about. This is the main thing. Now let us move on to the next topic. What happens is that if you are in the research field or you're writing papers, you're reading blogs about explainable AI, there are two terms that are often used interchangeably, right? There are two terms that is interpretability and explainability. You also, when you think in your mind, you may feel that these words look almost similar, but no, there's a slight difference between the definition of these two. So let us see and look what is the difference between interpretability and explainability. So when you are concerned, or let us say you are sitting in a company and your company is uh, passing or making an ML model or you're pass making an ML application. So let us say if a business wants high model transparency and wants to understand exactly why and how the model is generating predictions. That is, the business is concerned about the inner mechanisms of the AI and ML model, right? They are concerned that how the weights, how the parameters would be determining the output of the model, then it is called as the interpretability, right? Now, how interpretability is different from explainability? Explainability is concerned that how an ML model can explain itself or explain its behavior in the human terms, right? In interpretability, you would be getting, for example, some probabilistic results or some numericals that would be only understood by the person who, was, who had made the project or who's working on a model. But here with the explainability, we are concerned that the ML model and its behavior is being understood fully by a human, right? So there are various explainability algorithms or things that are available in the market right now. Uh, you may see a lot of papers using Sharp, Lime and everything. But this big domain that we'll discuss like further in the slides. Now let us look at a very important term that what is the trade-off between the accuracy of the model and the interpretability of the model. So if you see in the slide, you can observe that higher is the accuracy, lower is the model interpretability, right? So more complex the model becomes, less uh, more, uh, more complex the model becomes, henceforth it becomes very difficult to interpret them, right? So I think this is a very basic concept and this was just like discussed with you so that you understand that these are two different terms and how they are correlated to each other, right? Now a question arises, what is the need and the role of explainable AI? Just imagine you're working in a business company and you are applying explainable AI along with your ML learning process. 
So just take in your heart and sit there and just imagine what would be the exact need and role of explainable AI. You may need it for the verification of the systems. That is, you may need to justify why certain results are coming. You may control the results where you find out or you may improve the system or you will be able to or you needed them to explain to discover that why certain things are happening in the system right so what is the need and role of explainable ai to explain to justify explain to control explain to improve and explain to discover right i hope i'm not going too fast right now and everyone is like able to grasp the basics of the explainable AI, what I have discussed till now. Now, one thing that comes along with the need of explainable AI right now is the European government or U European Union recently, or like past two, three years back, came up with the GDPR rules and regulation. Now, what are GDPR rules and regulations? The GDPR refers to General Data Protection Regulation. Now, this GDPR rules and regulation ask the companies or the individuals that they have the right to ask a company why a model is making certain uh, uh, decisions, right? And according to this, now what happens is that every company has to give a reason while they are using any ML model application, they have to give a reason that why it was giving a certain results. And they also granted the end user or they also granted you as an end user that you have the right to ask the company or any product that you're using or any organization that developed an AI application you also have the right on your terms to ask that why the things were happening in certain way. Henceforth, because of coming up with the GDPR rules and because of this implementation, the role of explainable AI or the research and the need for the explainable AI grew more in demand like in past few years. So this is also one of the major concerns, right? Now, let us go into a bit of more technical details. Now, there would be different kinds of methods of explainability, right? The methods of explainability may be divided into different categories. They would be different for the different format types, right? It may be dependent upon the type of the data or the format type that you expect you get out uh, the type of explainability that you feel that you should get. That is, you may get the explainability in the form of rules, numericals, textual or visual, right? Or the type of the input data that you are passing into the model, or depending upon the type of the problem, there would be different explainability methods. According to the classification problem, you may have different explainability methods. According to uh, for the regression problem, you may have different explainability methods, right? According to the scope of the problem, you may have different explainability methods. You may have like the, your scope of the problem may be global or local. Similarly, at what stage? Now, this is important. That will be discussed further in details at what stage of the learning process the explainability method is applied, it may be divided into two categories, the ad hoc and the post hoc, that can further be divided upon model agnostic and model specific. I know I'm going into the more technical details right now, but I'll discuss this more in details in the coming up slides, right? So I discussed that uh, classification of explainability methods based upon the scope, they may be post hoc methods or they may be ad hoc methods, right? So the work that I do in my PhD is I'm concerned about the post hoc methods, right? So let us see what are post hoc methods. Post hoc explainability methods are the methods that are applied after training the model. Right? Is it fine? 
post hoc explainability methods are the methods that are applied after the training of the model, right? So let us look at this image. I'll give everyone like two or three minutes. Oh, sorry, I'll just give everyone, sorry. I'll just, okay. Yeah, I'll just give everyone five seconds or few seconds just to look at this image and comprehend whatever I said right now. So the, I talked about the different categories of the methods of explainability, how they can be categorized, right? I talked about the ad hoc methods that are applied before training the model and the post hoc methods or the post hoc explainability methods are the methods that are applied after training the model, right? So in my PhD research, I'm concerned about the post hoc explainability methods, right? Now let us move forward. I hope everyone is clear or has the basic idea about the post hoc methods or what or when the post hoc methods are applied, right? Now, apart from it, there is one more bigger research that is going into the domain right now is about how to evaluate the different explainability methods, right? Since we all know we can research about the types of methods, but we always know or we always need to understand about the different evaluation methods. Now, the evaluation methods could be divided into two categories. Either they could be objective evaluations, right? Or either they could be human-centered evaluations, right? So when we are talking about the objective evaluations, I'll not go into the very technical details right now that can be discussed with me like afterwards. But when I talk about the objective evaluations, these include infidelity, sensitivity, and all these things, right? When to, I'm talking about the human-centered evaluations is that how a human would be comprehending your results that you're getting from the explainability models, right? Now, your human-centered evaluations would again be categorized as qualitative and quantitative, right? Now, apart from it, it is very necessary to understand that not only in academia, but a lot of industries are using now explainability methods. So this is just a slide that shows the landscape of the companies that are using or developing products for the explainability. Right. So as you see, uh, uh, IBM has also developed like few models like uh, IBM. I don't remember the exact name right now. I think someone can Google it. It's IBM 360 something that uh, helps or they are using in the products to give exact explanations that why certain results are happening or why the model is giving certain results. Right. Now, let us go or walk through my PhD research. The work that I'm currently working upon is oriented towards the post hoc explanation for RNNs using the state transition representations for the time series data, right? I hope everyone is clear what, uh, or everyone have a basic knowledge or idea about what exactly is explainability, what are the post hoc explainability methods, and I assume everyone has very basic idea about RNNs and uh, the type of input, the data that I'm dealing with in my research is the time series data and the type of explanation or the explanation that has been represented in my research would be in the form of the state transition diagrams, right? So now let us look what are exactly the state transition. So whenever you want to model or you want to show the inner working of any uh, device or any model, you feel that that working can be described using some state transition diagrams or some diagrams, right? So state transition representations describe the logical transition of a system to the various stages of operation by representing different states, right? So I'm to, I have just like took out the separate words from my PhD title right now so that I can like combine them together and explain again to you, right? So I explained about what is, what is the meaning of the word post hoc. 
I explained about what is explainability. And now I'm discussing the state transition representations that my explainability or my explanations from my research, you will get in the form of state transition diagrams, right? Now, the state transition diagrams could be of different types, right? They would be in the form of either finite state automata, they would be either in the state of probabilistic finite state automata, or they would be in the form of fuzzy automata, Markov chains, or differential equations. But what I'm concerned in my research is, I'm concerned about the finite state automata as a state transition representation for the explanations of the RNNs, right? Now you will ask me that how exactly are you learning from RNN? So the concept of extracting rules from RNN, right, is called as a rule extraction from RNN. Now, what exactly the rule extraction from RNN mean? The rule extraction from RNN refers to the process of finding and building the formal computation models and the machines of the underlying RNNs, right? Now, this process is typically done in the form of the finite state machines, right? So it is observed that the RNNs are very good at processing the sequences, right and finite state machines are also very good at processing the sequences henceforth we observe and about after doing a lot of literature review we can say that the finite state machines are able or are able to mimic the rnn and its decision making process to a satisfactory level right so i'll just like go through it again what I'm working upon. I'm working upon the post hoc explanations for RNN using finite state automata as the state transition representation for the time series data. So my type of input into my model would be time series data, right? So if anyone uh, doesn't remember uh, about the RNNs, so I would give like few seconds, everyone to go through this slide and take a quick glimpse upon the type of the model that I would be working upon, right? So now let us look at the inner workflow, what I'm trying to do, or if you feel confused that how I'm able to extract the DFAs or the finite state automatas from the RNN. So I know it's a bit confusing, but let us, I have just made my whole work in a very abstract level workflow, right? So let us say, I give some input and my input data is a sequence type or it is a time series data, right? I split my data. I pass this to various different RNN architectures. I train my data. And since I'm working upon the post hoc explainability methods, my explainability methods would be applied after training of the model, right? Now let us look how exactly I am able to form the DFAs or the finite state automata from the trained RNN model. So what I do is after training the RNN model, I cluster the activated hidden states of the RNN model. These clusters of the activated hidden states of the RNN model, these clusters act as the states for my finite state automata, right? And these transitions of the finite state automata discuss or tell about how the decision was made when passing through the different states of the finite state automata, right? Apart from it, the results, apart from the results or the accuracy results or anything that you're getting from the model, I have added an additional interface of explainability after training the model to help us understand that how exactly the decision-making process of the RNN was going through. Now, uh, I really don't have time today to discuss the exact algorithms and details about how exactly these transitions are happening, how exactly these activated uh, uh, 
Caribbean states clustered are formed, but this is just an overview or a basic idea that what exactly is happening in my research and how the results I'm getting. Now, a question may arise in your mind that despite of image, visuals and numerical numbers, why am I exactly working upon or using a finite state automata for my explanations, right? So a good argument to that point is that it is considered that the finite state automata are in a form of graph and graphs are like easily interpretable, right? And also to the finite state automata, it is very easy to understand how the sequence are being processed. Right. For example, if you have taken the course of uh, automata or theory of computation in your bachelor's or master's, you may remember that how language strings are being processed. Right. In the similar way, when you remember how a regular grammar is being processed, you can easily understand that how finite state automata are helpful in understanding the sequence. Right. How they are being processed. Henceforth, I feel that these are the two basic solid arguments of the motivation why I'm using the finite state automata as the state transition representation for the explainability, right? There are various, many other reasons, but these are the two reasons that I'm mainly motivated while doing my research right now. So here are the references that I like used to prepare the material for you all and to discuss and gain knowledge for myself. And thank you, everyone. And I'm here for answering the questions or anything. Thank you so much, Yardi. That was really interesting. Um, I'm just going to ask everyone um, who has a question in person first, if you have. Um, otherwise, I, I have a question myself. So um, I'm wondering on what kind of applications you could uh, use this for? Uh, I guess there's a right range, but uh, one that you think of. Yeah, so currently, like according to my literature review that I've done, most of the people are going to use it for the financial data, right? And if you are working with some clinical experts, more of the people working with the EEG data set or who are dealing with the brainwave signals, they require an explanation that how the things were happening. So these are the two basic applications that people would be using it. Okay. That's something Karen might be interested in. <laughs> yeah, we have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, first, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. That was really fantastic. Uh, and uh, just, I was wondering, uh, what kind of rule do you extract from RNA? I don't know if you could hear. Yeah, yeah. So rule extraction is like a very big concept from RNA. I'm only, uh, so rule, uh, I would say if I go to that definition again, the rule extraction is the process of like mimicking your RNAs, right? So I'm mimicking the RNNs or I'm like trying to mimic the RNNs using the finite state automata right now. So I would like, uh, I'll take a lot of time to go in the in-depth details of the rule extraction. So maybe you and I can discuss it later. So yeah. is that fine? <laughs> yes, thanks. Okay. Any other question here? Um, is, if anyone has a question online, you can either unmute or uh, leave us a message in the chat. Very warm, I mean. I just hope that, uh, that everyone is now comfortable with the terms of explainability and how the post hoc and the ant hoc are different. So I hope everyone gets away with this today after today's session. Sure. Yeah, Thanks. that was a great insight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think we're going to thank you again and we're going to move to our next speaker. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Can I give us one question? Can we use XAL in drug discovery and any detection application? Uh, I guess so. To be honest, I haven't done literature review on this part right now. So I'll look into it and I will surely answer you for that part. So right now I was more concerned about the financial data and the EEG data right now. So I haven't gotten much time or I'm still in the initial stage to say about during the drug discovery and other detect detection applications. Great, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we're gonna, thank you again, Gajit. And now I'm gonna ask Vicky, Vicky, sorry, to come in. So Vicky Tumay Lee, sorry if I'm mispronouncing. She's oh, you got it, perfect. The founder of um, Hi Ladies Dublin. She's co-founder of Coding Grace. She's uh, Dublin co-director of Women Who Code Dublin and a lot of other ones as well. And she's gonna uh, give us an insight about how it is to create a community uh, for inclusion in this uh, world of tech and science. Good evening, everyone. And on um, uh, behalf of Pi Ladies Dublin, and thank you to um, the IS for inviting us and having this, uh, Samira and Priya, Priya for uh, setting all this up and having this collab event. We're very excited. I'm, I'm super, well, I'm super excited about the collaboration, but I'm also like, wish I was there with you this evening uh, in person. Um, but maybe next time, maybe a weekend, I can drop over and we can do another event. Um, so, um, so I, yes, I am a coder. Um, I also uh, run tech events uh, like Pi Ladies uh, Dublin, which this evening um, is a lot easier because the folks over in Galway doing it for me. Uh, advocate diversity in tech by very various uh, kind of initiatives and uh, yes I do like cats I love them even uh, and that's my twitter handle but I'm also on Mastodon uh, if people want to find me uh, I'll, sh I'll show you what my handle is at the end of the slides um, so I've been involved in a lot of different things um, between my for my journey to where I am right now and um, just to give you a slight high kind of an overview of um, of what I've done in the past. So I was a curator for uh, in games um, uh, for Science Gallery Dublin, and I was researching that. That was a lot of fun. Completely, you know, just being paid to play games and doing an uh, uh, go to games festivals and working an amazing team to build up uh, an amazing exhibition. Um, I was also the tech community liaison with Dal Patch Labs. That was the middle one there. Um, so I connected them with uh, the tech community in, and especially the Irish tech scene with their space in Dog Patch Labs, which they were launched at the time. And via them, I, I was able, to, I was uh, privileged to be invited to meet uh, Harry and Megan at the diverse, uh, the women uh, kind of diversity in tech or women in tech kind of industry or startup. So that is actually uh, my right arm, I can say, uh, because the other side is Anno D, uh, the other arm is Anno D's, so from Silicon Republic. So uh, we were sitting right opposite them. So it was a great opportunity. And down below was, um, I was over in London. Um, it was curating a lot of kind of events and speak or uh, tech companies and speakers and fun stuff. And that's John Romero playing death match. On, on Doom, and we're uh, working with the IDA and encouraging people to, or, um, uh, uh, and encouraging people to come over to Ireland uh, at the, uh, to to work in the tech industry a number of years ago, and of course the last one there is my 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 most favorite conference that I was involved with it was like a meetup of all meetups since I deal a lot with, with community, and um, we brought in community organizers from. Uh, around the tech scene to come along all under one roof we had exhibitors we had like a lot of um uh tech demos and this particular one is a guy an indie game developer from uh from netherlands who's playing the cello uh defending doing a tower defense defending himself against four people on game controllers so as he changes he's playing live as he changes the tone and the pitch he can actually have like mines and lasers and stuff like that so it's kind of um so it's kind of 
uh, a very kind of um, uh, scenic route of um, my journey um, through different uh, tech community uh, to uh, to where I am right now, advocating diversity, um, especially in the island of Ireland, so not just um, here in Republic Ireland, but also Northern Ireland as well. And um, how it all started was Python, of course. Um, so I encountered Python back in 2002 uh, with my uh, uh, colleague, but now husband. And uh, we uh, saw that there was a Python meetup in 2004 and we got really, really super excited. And we went to that and they rebooted in 2005 uh, with another organizer. And we were getting sick of huddling around a tiny laptop in the pub uh, so they wanted to have a like like what you have there a room with uh, projectors and speakers. How hard could it be? You know, remember back then there was only like I think you can count about probably six or seven meetup groups back then. There was no meetup. There's no event bright or anything like that. Um, so we so I just took the ball and ran with it because no one put up their hand. So I ran with it for like uh, for about over 10 years <laughs> before I handed over to the current community organizers. And uh, we did regular meetups. And during that period, as you can see, there was a uh, PyCon Ireland, which was the Irish conference, uh, Python conference. And that started because uh, a, whole bunch, a whole core of us, which was quite a small group at the time in 2009, uh, we were in uh, attending Europython in Birmingham and they were looking for the next host city. And they all looked at me and I said, we haven't even run, We our meetups are barely 20 odd people. How on earth can we run a conference? Their conference is like 200 and something, which is huge back then. And uh, bear in mind that uh, Europython and other PyCons, uh, Py Python conferences, there, were, uh, there weren't that many around the world. So um, we, so that, as with all good ideas, on that fateful night uh, in February 2010 in Neary's off Grafton Street, nice pub by the way, I was the one who was sober because I was on the dry and I can uh, attest to the story that I f fully pushed back on not running Europython, but I agreed on a compromise that we were run an Irish conference, which we did that year in July and we had nearly 100 people, which is amazing because... Um, uh, so many people came to the conference, both locally and internationally. The community group itself grew. Uh, so it grew from the 20 yard, which was amazing numbers back then, to we can expect up to 60, 80 to 100 people coming to these kind of in-person events. Um, so um, out of that, um, I ran uh, the first four uh, PyCons uh, Ireland. Uh, so I, I wrapped up in 2013 and handed that over to someone else. And in tw PyCon 2013 is where I launched uh, PyLadies Dublin um, because uh, um, it, was an in I, it was inspired by uh, when I invited a keynote speaker uh, called Lynn Root. She was our first technical keynote speaker. So uh, just to remind you, back all technical tech conferences back then, it was I was trying to really hard to try and get as many people to come, as a diverse audience as possible. It was really, really tough. So uh, I want I was trying to find um, um, diverse speakers and Lynn um, accepted to be our keen, our first technical keynote speaker that year. So she was also the co-founder of the San Francisco chapter of Pi Ladies. So that's why I said she inspired me. So I decided to launch Pi Ladies Dublin um, at PyCon Ireland, cake and all. And since then, um, we've uh, run uh, workshops, uh, regular monthly meetups. <clears throat> the groups are quite small as opposed to Py Python Ireland, which is on purpose because um, I asked the community what they wanted. Uh, the usual style of meetups is like this uh, is kind of uh, 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 two talks with pizza and beer in the middle. And we didn't want that. And um, before then, the in-person events that we had uh, before COVID, we invited people to bring, encourage them to bring along the laptop. So, and also encourage speakers to give shorter talks which is, I understand, is quite tough to do if you want to talk about your topic of uh, interest. So for those, uh, the reason for that is I didn't want to alienate people who are new into Python. And I also do not want to bore people who are uh, already um, working on Python in industry and, and, and are professionals. So what we did was um, uh, to encourage people to give short talks. So afterwards, people can break off into groups. So you can actually go 
and uh, bring your laptop along, ask the speaker to, um, to, to deep dive a bit more with them about their topic, um, get, you know, uh, get their GitHub re repository and do some demos and write code together. Other folks can work on their own projects. Uh, you can ask for help. Maybe you need to set up your development environment or you can be completely antisocial, work on your own project. That is okay because you're in a room full of people um, you know, uh, who are really interested in Python and you get in that buzz. Uh, also, you can also run or go around and chit chat with people, which is mostly what I do because out of since 2013, I probably might have taken out my laptop to code probably about three times because there's so many cool people to talk with uh, at the event. So, um, again, uh, we, yes, we so at the moment we run uh, monthly, we still run kind of regular. Uh, Pi Ladies Dublin. Today is an exception. I do uh, kind of uh, adapt to different days. So mainly we run on third Tuesday of each month uh, um, uh, unless uh, certain circumstances arises. But because of COVID, um, we were uh, ended up running streaming a lot of our uh, talks. So we decided instead of doing um, like in person where we brought asked people to code together, we decided to do short talks and Q&A and keep it, try to keep it within one hour because we know all know about Zoom fatigue. So, um, so, um, so what we're trying to, so my plan is for next year is that because everyone's so excited, like a lot of you turned up in person over there in Galway is amazing. And a lot of people came along to the in-person events in Dublin as well. And uh, we were super, uh, and people are super excited about that. So we want to still have that mix where we want to have people to come along and people still access uh, remotely uh, the talks. So not everywhere uh, has hybrid uh, kind of um, uh, availability to use a hybrid approach. So I'm working on that to see how I can actually improve that. Otherwise it'd be either in-person or um, remote. And if there's a hybrid uh, option like this evening, uh, we will go with it as well. Um, so um, you don't have to be in Ireland as well to be uh, like Python is, um, the Python Software Foundation um, uh, is uh, an is a not-for-profit that looks after the Python language, but they also look after projects um, like the core projects and they have grants work group. So if you want to be involved with Python and want to understand more about it and dig in further about it, check out the Python Software Foundation. I was nominated a fellow in uh, uh, soon after I was at um, uh, was involved with Python Ireland and PyCon Ireland. And um, I, I was invited to the grants work group where we review um, kind of uh, um, applications for people for help to start up their conferences or their uh, coding meetups, uh, because I know what it's like to be able to start running a conference and uh, like PyCon Ireland, it was really tough to start off with nothing. And the Python Soft Foundation came and gave us a grant uh, back then before I joined, <laughs> it was before the grants working group. And the Euro Python Society is a more uh, so Python Soft Foundation also looks after PyCon US. So they are based in the US. The Euro Python Society are based in, uh, in Europe, uh, specifically initially started in Sweden. Uh, uh, and um, I'm actually back on the board again this year, just um, got voted on, but um, they have various different work groups if you want to get involved there. So uh, for the, uh, mainly is for their next year Python edition. So this will be 2023 coming up, uh, but they do have working groups like um, if you're interested in programming or interested in diversity, uh, you're interested in comms. Um, that's one way of getting involved and it doesn't have to be, you know, locally, um, uh, all the local groups, which is great. But if you want to expand further and be involved more in the kind of uh, the more co uh, other foundations, there's others out there. These are ones that I've been involved in. And, and um, recently, last year, I was awarded uh, the Community Spirit Award, which I'm still just, I don't believe it because uh, normally it's my, uh, I have other people that I look up to who who, who get these awards um, and the Euro Python Society Fellow Grant as well, um, all in you know, recognition of what I've been doing with Python, which is still blows my mind. Um, it's just, uh, I, I just want to mention it. <laughs> it's, it's just that people say I don't say it enough. So, um, but yeah, it's not about these recognitions at all. Um, it's more definitely about the community because uh, this is one is that being part of the PSF grants work group. This is how, this is what from one of the reports uh, in 2021. And these are the kind of the grants that uh, we approved and funded various different events around the world. 
um and uh, so it's kind of um being being able to pay it back and pay it for because they helped me out to where I am right now and I want to give that back um and remember um um I also mentioned that uh, uh about Lynn Root well I bumped into her at Europython in 2016 we were in the same room I didn't even know she was there um we were she was tweeting away and she normally runs pie ladies lunches at Europython and I said oh my god I didn't know you were there would you are you running any pie ladies lunch and she said no so we decided to do an ad hoc one and through Twitter, Twitter and also shouting at organizers to tell everyone please come up to the top table <laughs> uh, when the lunch breaks uh, we're gonna do an ad hoc pie ladies lunch so um so that's Lynn in the green Lynn Root who inspired me to start a pie ladies Dublin and uh, she's also the one with all the stickers and all the different swags and stuff from uh, in, uh, when if you ever go to PyCon US. But she gave me a bunch, a lot of stickers as well uh, to give out over here during EuroPython. Um, but just to let you know that it was this EuroPython back in 2010 or 2009, it was like 200 and something people, 250 people. This is like over 1200 people uh, available. So holding a table whenever it comes out and really hungry, uh, think of it like you're in a cinema and uh, you have a whole row and it's not booked, the seats are not booked and you're holding down the whole row and everyone is late coming to it and everyone looks at you going, you know, you should not be, you should be <laughs> freeing up those seats. So that's what it felt like, but it was worth it because I got to talk to a lot of amazing uh, uh, PyLadies members and organizers. Um, and guess what? As I mentioned, kind of gave it away there, Py uh, EuroPython did come to Dublin in the end. It took 10 years uh, plus two because of COVID. And there's me in the middle, and that's the whole team, both in person and uh, remotely. And it was fantastic. I, I still can't believe Europe is in Dublin. And I was um, asked to give uh, the, the opening speech, and I said that a lot. I can't believe Europe is in Dublin. And if you didn't get a chance to go to Europe, um, you should check out, um, you know, if you get a chance to go to it, uh, they do have, um, it's a full week uh, Python conference with multiple tracks and workshops, and they do have um, a, a kind of a fin financial aid as well. So keep an eye out in, in, uh, for next year's uh, EuroPython, especially if uh, you want to give a talk or you want to go there as an attendee and you need some financial assistance. Uh, but give me a shout because I'm, I'm back on the board. If there's anything, I can also um, answer questions there as well. And how you can get involved with Python, uh, 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 you can join uh, various community groups. So uh, like the Python Software Foundation, the European Society, the Django uh, Software Foundation as well. Uh, you can help your local groups, uh, not just uh, PyLadies, but there's um, there's a, about over 70 groups around the island of Ireland. So there's lots of different groups like Women in AI Ireland, there's like Herbless Data, there's um, yeah, there's like so many groups. And um, you can also uh, online, you can also connect with Py, uh, PyLadies in a very active Slack group. Uh, so slack slackin.pyladies.com. Hopefully that still works. And um, also, the Irish tech scene, if you're curious about getting, um, um, seeing what's going on, irishtechcommunity.com is another Slack group. And most of the tech event organizers are hanging around there as well. And it's a, one of the oldest uh, and largest active tech community uh, groups uh, online. You want to go, uh, mention I go, uh, go further afield um, to get involved. Uh, I mentioned these groups already, uh, as well as um, the ones I mentioned above. Uh, there's also Pi Data as well for all the folks who are um, um, uh, in in the area of data. Uh, you can also contribute if you're uh, to to projects uh, like documentation or fix uh, checking out the code or contribute to fix bug fixes and stuff. This might be sprints at conferences, or you can start your own. And of course, because a lot of these are open source projects, uh, don't forget that uh, you know it'd be really nice if you can uh, donate some uh so some uh some some money i suppose uh to to these organizations and projects um the other thing is uh yes pie ladies uh, next year we are we are looking for speakers um uh you can drop me an email uh dublin at .com. and um if the if the uh like this evening's talk as i mentioned earlier will be uploaded to pie ladies dublin and any future uh all the past current and future talks will be up there in um, our YouTube channel as well. And you can, uh, we're also on Twitter, 
Facebook, um, Instagram, which I don't really use that much, and LinkedIn. Um, and of course, because YouTube <laughs> content stuff, like and subscribe. I say this a lot. <laughs> and uh, hit that notification bell if you want to see what the next upcoming video <laughs> and live streams. Um, but if there's any other diversity events or Python events based here in Ireland or uh, at Island of Ireland or any one kind of European ones, do let me know. I will add it in um, our next uh, Pi Ladies event. Um, yeah, that'd be super useful for folks. And um, I also um, curate a lot of these events in diversity and tech.fyi. Um, so you will all in so there you will find a list of all the diversity in tech groups that are here in on the island of Ireland. They may or if they're out of date, let me know. If there's new groups, let me know. Uh, you you feel free to also do a pull request if you want to add to it yourself as well. It's all on GitHub. And then there's another section which is um, curating some of the community events, tech events in Ireland, as well as um, the island of Ireland, as well as um, diversity in tech events around the island of Ireland, just to have it all in one place. Um, again, if I'm missing anything, let me know. And that's about it. Hope, I don't know if I've gone over time or not, uh, but that's my uh, Beacons page. If you can see all the stuff I'm, in, I'm doing, I'm involved in. Um, I'm also, as I mentioned, I'm on uh, Mastodon as, as well. If, you, if, you, if you're there, um, you know, we can follow each other. And if there's any questions, um, email me at Dublin at PyLadies.com. And uh, thank you again this evening to um, everyone who came along. Uh, to the organizers, everyone involved as well, and to all our speakers and sponsors. So that's the end. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, if not, I'll hand it back to the floor again uh, so Priya can uh, take <laughs> introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much, Vicky. That was really interesting and very insightful, especially for us who are trying to build this new community um, in Galway, well, from Galway anyway, so that's uh, very inspiring. Uh, I saw there's someone who just put a question in the chat. So what oh, do you see well, from having ladies only events and forums? I forgot to mention that all my events are not ladies only. Uh, they're open to everyone. Uh, Pi Ladies um, Dublin is a chapter of Pi Ladies uh, Global. And at the time they were discussing if uh, we should change it to Pi Diversity. Um, but they decided to, to keep Pi Ladies just because it, ha it has been, um, everyone knows the name, uh, the brand. So it's really down to each chapter um, uh, organizer um, if they wanted to keep it to women only because of uh, something happened or you know they, they prefer it that way or to everyone uh, or to other folks uh, like myself who are open up to anyone can come along. So you don't have to be female. You can be anyone from any kind of uh, uh, kind of um, uh, oh, uh, anyone um, at all from the community who's interested in Python and uh, and just want to meet and network with everyone. Um, but as I said, it's uh, for me, I'm more focused on more broader kind of um, being open to everyone to be coming on to, the, to these events. And with Pi Ladies, the reason why I stuck with Pi Ladies is uh, again, they're being very helpful and supportive and their Slack group has been amazing. There's a, a wealth of um, uh, resources and the organizers channel there, they're so, so helpful as well. And they're trying to streamline the way that to make it more formal and how they uh, run the, they're building up a committee there and everything. So I'm learning loads from them and that's why I'm stuck with Pi Ladies uh, instead of like, you know, saying, oh, I don't want ladies in any of my groups. Same, for instance, my other, another group of mine, um, which was briefly mentioned earlier in the introduction, was coding is Coding Grace. And uh, that is a, a, an Irish initiative, a not-for-profit, again, to we, where we um, advocate diversity in tech through events, collaboration, and curating news and events. And um, Coding Grace is an homage to Grace Hopper. Uh, but if you didn't know that, you just it's just Coding Grace is kind of a name that is kind of quite nice, like Coding with Grace. And of course, my name is not Grace because I'm always the front person for Coding Grace. Um, I mean, it's still Vicky <laughs> and Grace is nowhere in it. So I think um, people do ask the question, um, but for my all my events, they tend to be uh, open to everyone. 
And I kind of, I put that, I try to highlight that in the FAQ as well. And, but I do have people asking me, is it women only? And that's very, very nice of people. And I do appreciate that. Um, so I hopefully, um, um, hopefully just saying uh, pie ladies or a diversity in tech events the benefits are the people who come along to these events um are the 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 right people that's what i'm saying people will self-select themselves even if there's no no ladies or women in there just saying diversity itself will be enough to be for people to uh to, to be self-selected to come to these events um and hopefully the right people as well thank you thanks vicky yeah okay, i guess I have a question yeah vicky can i <laughs> yeah. How you convert a friend to husband through <laughs> Python? You are you are coding as a friend, and suddenly it's for twenty years almost. You have <laughs> not even <laughs> tell me the story. I want to know. <laughs> well, well, Python came out really. We were looking for new technology. Like when you're when you're coding, you you are you're a techie, especially a young coder. You're always looking for new technologies and. Um, I was working in some microsystems and I did not want to do anything with, <laughs> I can say that now, I don't have to want to do anything with Java. I want to do something more, other open source stuff. And Python came along and it was in, internally, um, we used it to, um, you know, um, make life easier for ourselves as in uh, make, make, we were packaging a lot of stuff and we were wrapping a lot of scripts. So back then it was purely scripting for us. Uh, so between the two of us, like he was on our, my team, so we we're both into the same, same stuff, like really excited about new technology. And um, and um, as as um, I suppose Python was kind of intertwined in our relationship as well, because uh, we went to the Python Ireland meetups. He started to help me out with a lot of the Python Ireland meetups, especially PyCon Ireland, the very first PyCon Ireland in 2010. We were both uh, on vacation in Hong Kong. We spent most of our two weeks in Starbucks. Um, over a hotspot back then and um, just um, a very first conference so I but he was doing scheduling and programming I was trying to well I was doing programming as well I was trying to figure out swag talking to sponsors like eight hours ahead because we're in Hong Kong <laughs> and I was figuring out like um, the web we're both we did both at the website so we were both very hands-on from uh, doing a lot of stuff for Python Ireland and PyCon Ireland from like websites uh, social media and actually do, doing a lot of logistics and admin. I end up doing a lot of the admin, uh, which I am um, which I learned a lot from. Um, it's not fun, but it is good skill to have um, as well. But yeah, I think that's, it's not, it's more like, you know, common interests and in how we met and, and mm -hmm. Python kind of came along because I'm like, two, I, I actually did a Perl course two days uh, from work, uh, some pay for a, a Perl course, like internally. And I did that. And then Python came along and I dropped Perl like two days afterwards. I kind of like the cert was on the on gathering dust on my desk and I completely forgot about Perl. And I just went in to use Python to improve um, our workflow process, made life uh, as in it was quicker and more, uh, more efficient with generated reports and things like that. So uh, Python really helped uh, both career wise and also, you know, um, Inter intertwined between my relationship uh, with my husband as well. So um, he still does a lot of Python, but he also does uh, works on a lot of different types of languages as well. So I think it's just that uh, not as exciting as you think <laughs> the story would be, but it's more like common interests at the end of the day. And our love of Python, the community itself was very, very nice. That's why I'm still here with Python because the community themselves has been really, really nice to me. Uh, whenever I ask questions, they come back with answers and they were never judging and uh, very, very supportive. So that's why I'm trying to give back as much as I can to anyone who's coming into the Python community. Thanks, Vicky. Thanks, Vicky. I just have Thank you. a very quick question because we're running out of time, but um, what kind of top tips would you give to people who are trying to create a community like, like PyLadies, for example, uh, how to engage with people? What would you recommend? I think um, representation means a lot. So you don't have to like yeah, I know Pi Ladies is in the name, but if I was running a conference um, or, or events, um, I think most of first of all is the people who's organizing it, and then the the speakers you bring on. So you can bring a mix of people, and um, it's very apparent when people see what's of it, what 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 you are, what the event is about. Um, people will understand that your uh, you know your organization is inclusive and friendly and diverse. And um, 
But in the background of, of course, you go seek out, you know, specifically, you know, non-male speakers or um, uh, or you try to mix it up a bit, you know, uh, so it's more balanced. Um, so you kind of when you it, it takes I think you, you, uh, it's a lot more work to be uh, it looks it looks like it's kind of uh, quite straightforward, but you do have to be very self-aware when you organize something, the language, um, the messaging that you put out. Um, and also, uh, don't be afraid to uh, apologize. You make mistakes as well because we're all human at the end of the day. And um, and I think the first thing for me when I see when I see an event, I will just look at the names. I will look who's organizing it, and um, and that that kind of um, for, so that's from uh, from my point of view. Um, so if you're an organizer, try to um, you know. I suppose it's it's your it's your personality as well when you organize it, uh, but don't do don't do everything yourself. I'm trying to trying to learn that still. Uh, try to get um, some partners in crime to help you out uh, if you're out sick or you're out on holidays to keep the event going, keep them keep it go, become keep it regular. So as I mentioned, that pie ladies is on the third Tuesday each month. Um, Try to keep to that, uh, except uh, unless there's some exceptions, which is fine. Um, but don't change it too much because people will say, "Oh, I have that third Tuesday just for pie ladies, and now it's not there." And they get, you know, so it's more kind of keep it regular. Um, your messaging is important, and of course, yourself, you're you're representing. Uh, you're the front face of the 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 community group you're doing, and there's a lot of. Um, you know, uh, social media, you just, you, you have to push it out there, talk to people, uh, find the right people to help share, share your messages around. So um, I'm still working on that as well. There's still a lot to learn, but, um, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I hope that answers your question. There's like more kind of, you know, <laughs> I'm very stubborn. I just go like, I have to get this done. I will do this. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is more um, uh, definitely, uh, the community and you do ask the community every so often like how how am I doing do you want me to still keep running this because it does take a lot of work as well and uh, you know definitely but you de de generally get a lot of positive responses and and while this is really needed that's why you're doing it but you need to check in on yourself as well um, uh, mindfulness and well-being looking after your health it's really important listen to those have very supportive friends and family listen to them when they say you're burning out you're burning out take take a step back get some help you know so that's the big one thank you thank, thank you. you so much Vicky. <laughs> any uh, good tips i think we yeah. definitely take them into yeah. account <laughs> thank you. if you want help from me as well just let me know uh um as well so that's uh, my doors are always open um great, great to have you here thanks thanks, thanks again thank you. I'm just going to introduce Karen Conway from Fidelity Investment. No, I do myself. Sorry. Yeah, and uh, she's going to do her talk. <laughs> Apologies for round two on introductions. I think I, I think I deserve two rounds of introduction. I get two shots at it here. Um, so yes, Director of Technology Management is probably more at this stage along the lines of kind of program management moved into leadership a, a couple of years ago. My background is IT, so I did a degree in IT here in uh, formerly known as the ECP, uh, now known as the University of Galway. Can I look at number 40? Yeah, okay, <laughs> cool. Um, yes, so 20 years of fidelity. Um, and then more recently, I'm actually graduating next week from a postgrad in AI management because I suppose we started moving into chatbots in our area and I wanted to learn a little bit more about natural language processing. So I couldn't find a course to do online that I wanted to learn everything about and understand it. So I ended up working with myself, ITAG, SkillNet Ireland and the University of Galway. And we put together a course um, and the course actually got lodged last September. And this year we, we graduated this year. So uh, yes, so we get to do a uh, learn about AI management. What I did learn in that course and what actually amazed me about the time was that, you know, I was really surprised how much I was enjoying the ethics and law. When I was in the middle of having to read the law papers, it wasn't quite so exciting. But when I realized afterwards the impact really of ethics and law and what it is to our development, I really do think it's fascinating. And it's really caused me to think outside the box. So I'm not just thinking anymore about the algorithms and the mathematical solutions here. We have to think about the consequences of what we're building. And I think that's really, really important when it comes to that. 
Um, I'm involved in ITAC, so you know, with Carla and Coley here joining us today from ITAC, CEO of ITAC, but they're they're sponsoring this event tonight as well. But you know, I'm with the Digital Women's Forum, so it is for women in technology. I'm a huge promoter of women in technology. I'm involved in lots of different things around schools and actually Wyston here in University of Galway. Maybe just in the interest of time, I want to just keep moving. I, I won't have a slide to go through, but I do want to actually just say congratulations to Vicky. I, you know, I do work for a very large multinational company. So behind me in terms of getting onto all these committees and managing my time with that, I do have a lot of support behind me in terms of that. So I think it's actually amazing the amount of work you're doing with Pi Ladies and the groups that you've done. So I think an absolute congratulations to you to give up your time for a community like that i can't imagine the amount of work that you put in from a personal perspective so i think that you know the fact that you're such an advocate for this i think congratulations i just wanted to call it out and of course garvey you also covered off some stuff that we'll probably touch on a little bit today i might pass over the stuff a little bit more considering that you're in the group and um, so just when we're kind of looking at the stuff we might cover off today what i was going to touch on today just a little bit about is what is ethics and trustworthy ai why do we need to know about it and realizing it, how can we actually make it happen? And what can you do about it? Sitting down here, writing around where it looks, what can you actually do about it? Right. So this is based on the European Commission um, has sent out kind of a guidelines around here. There is a law coming out. So it's in, there's a proposal in place. We're expecting the laws to kind of come into regulation probably around mid-2023. And realistically, by the time that it's going to be in place for people to actually have to follow is probably about 2024. The EU will be considered a lot of the leaders in this area. Um, and apologies, I'm not sure about kind of the Asian area, but in terms of we would be much ahead of the US. I work for a US multinational, so we do spend a lot of time that released last week, uh, sorry, last month, the White House AI Bill of Rights. Uh, very closely linked to the EU Commission Bill of the uh, Act of uh, in Artificial Intelligence Act. So th they do kind of build on each other. But today we're kind of focus, going to focus more a little bit on the European side, considering that we're based here. So what is trustworthy AI? So the framework that's been released is that we comply with the law and it must be ethical and it must be robust. There are three things that they're considering that what makes trustworthy AI. Briefly touch on what's lawful. So we know AI is fast evolving. You know, we have to keep up. Um, it's going to be very difficult for the EU to actually kind of fully regulate this. But, you know, what the guidelines would be is that it's human centric and you're doing it for the good of society and for people. And that is truly kind of the law that they're, they're trying to promote behind it. And um, there, because it's kind of very, very difficult to kind of approach it, like we're not going to be able to monitor every single algorithm that's out there. People would have to declare what's going on. So there is kind of four categories that they're putting out there and they're covered in unacceptable risk, high risk, limited risk, and minimal risk. So when we talk about like uh, unacceptable risk, we might be talking about threats to livelihoods, threats to, threats to society, maybe like a voice activated toy that would cause child to create harm. So something that is absolutely not allowed. High risk, you know, we're probably talking about transport, access to education. There was a case there in the UK over the last uh, year or two about the predictive grades um, and the scoring. So like truly that would be considered high risk. You're impacting people's education from that. Uh, credit scoring, um, you know, even in terms of social scoring for the government and credit for a loan. I think Gargi mentioned that in one of our examples about explainability, but that would be considered high risk. What we're looking about high risk is that there will be further regulations on that group. So there will be um, audits. Um, there's an opportunity for external auditors to come in and assess the work. We'll be looking for traceability. When I say we, I'm actually not going to be one of the auditors, but I am speaking on behalf of EU. Uh, they will be looking for further information and proof that that is actually being handled correctly and trying to be made as safe as possible. Limited risk, you're probably looking at a chatbot. You know, it could say stuff that we don't want it to say. Um, but at the end of the day, we also should give an option to opt out of the chatbot. That will be one of the guidelines that's given. And then low risk is probably um, kind of like your email spam filters, you know. So it's, and to be fair, most stuff that gets developed today will fall into the low risk category. Just to touch on biometrics, maybe remote biometric uh, identification is going to be considered really kind of high risk to unacceptable. There will be exceptions on it, we'll say a missing child or there's like um, 
a risk of terrorism or something like that. So there will be always exceptions, but at the end of the day, you know, it is going to be considered very high risk uh, uh, or acceptable. We want it to be robust. So why do we want it to be robust? We don't live in a perfect world. So it has to be able to react to different environments. It must protect people from harm. We want it to be safe from malicious and intentional uh, threats. And again, safe <clears throat> humans. We talk about safeguarding for unintended consequences. Like I said, we don't live in an ideal world. We don't know what's going to be out there, what's going to happen. There's a case with Tesla where they had 35 miles per hour on a, I'm not sure if you heard this, but a speed sign. And somebody got a bit of black tape and elongated the center of the tree. And when it interpreted it, it looked closer to an eight in terms of imagery comparison. Whereas from the human eye, you could still tell that it was a three, a 35, but it actually looked like 85 and, and the Tesla cars increased it to 85 miles per hour. So, you know, you have to be prepared for the safeguards and, and consequences of what could be out there. And the last thing I would say is like, you know, when you're looking at this is, I mean, and it's robust, like, could you actually have seen this coming? So, you know, there is always going to be things happening in the environment. Nobody predicted the pandemic, right? You know, could we have seen it coming? Maybe in December or January we could have, but certainly not the previous July. So, you know, the, the questions that sometimes we'll get asked that they may not actually have been uh, foreseeable. Um, so talking about, talking about ethical side a little bit here. So this is probably a little bit more details. And, you know, we do touch on the explicability, which kind of links back to what Gargi was talking about. But, you know, human autonomy. People have the right to make up their own mind. You know, we do not want AI to coerce people, manipulate them into choices. So how do you think about the Cambridge Analytica case and, you know, the US elections? Um, this would be one that would fall into maybe a little bit more persuasion. Um, you know, we want to talk about harm, the religion of harm. Obviously, we do not want it to harm anybody, but it also has to be psychological and the respect for dignity in terms of that. Um, we also need to be, when we talk about harm, be mindful like of the asymmetries of kind of power. AI can give certain areas a lot more power and a lot more knowledge. We need to make sure that that does not cause any disparities in groups. At the end of the day, we're looking for fairness. So, and I'm teaching on fairness, actually. Um, fairness is very subjective. What I think is fair might not be what you think is fair. You think about the child benefit in Ireland, actually. Every single person, every single parent in Ireland gets child benefit. Now, if I was on a low income, I might think, oh, well, I don't think the rich people should get it. But then I get it, and I think that I think it's fair that everybody get it. And then maybe people with no children think, well, why should anybody get it? Because they chose to have children. <laughs> So if you think about it, like fairness is very subjective, depending on who you are, or what that person is. So what we would just say instead is like maybe you try and keep free from bias and from discrimination. So fair is very different to that. But if you can reduce the bias in what you're trying to do. Um, equal access to good services and education. You know, I think Ireland does a really big push on that. And certainly in terms of the points, you know, obviously they have their challenges and everything like that. But the whole point was that it was trying to make it fair and accessible to all. And then the last thing is, I would say, just in terms of fairness, people need to be accountable for the decision. The government has decided to pay child benefit to everybody. So they are accountable for that decision and they have chosen to do that for a certain reason. Because uh, I get it, I'm not actually asking them why because I don't want to highlight it. But like to be fair, they, they're accountable for that decision. And I think when you make a decision and you're not sure whether it's fair or not, you have to understand why you made that decision and you know why you're going to stand behind it. Explicability, and I know Gargi touched on kind of transparency, but you know, I suppose from this perspective, it's a little bit bigger than just transparency. Transparency is a, a property, we would say, of the system. So we do want it to be transparent and we can see what it's doing. We talk about explainable AI. Can you tell me how that decision was made? Uh, but I think we also need, and I think Gargi did mention it though, the justification of the decision. We talk about the right to know. I have a right to know how that decision was made. And then we talk about the, you know, understand the consequences of those decisions. So like I get turned down for a loan. I need to understand that and what the consequences of that is. So. You know, we certainly have to be thinking about that. I'm not going to go into this slide. I did include it because it came from a different uh, area. This came from a research paper that Jobin had written in uh, 2019, and, and the link is to the paper there. But the point is, it's actually the same principle. It's different wording, 
but we ultimately always go back to we want to be free from harm, we want accountability, we want transparency, we want fairness, and we want to base on human rights. And that's where we're pushing for the AI. Um, right. This is very interesting, and I, I hope there's nobody working for these companies in here, but these are all on the public domain, so I, I did just include these here, but you know, I just wanted to highlight to you some certain cases that's out there that maybe kind of, you know, we think we're making the right decision, but when we actually take a step back, and in hindsight, hindsight is 2020, as they always say, but like we have the chatbot here, Blinder bot of this year, the Microsoft chatbot Tate. Well, Blinder bot uh, does think that actually Trump is the real president, just so you all know, and they some undesirable characteristics called out about Mark Zuckerberg that I'm not going to repeat here, but you know, the chatbot learns from what's put into it. So it needs to understand who's listening to the chatbot and what they're going to believe from that chatbot. Um, again, similar with Tay, you know, um, it, it, it became racist because of all the information that was being put into it. And then it just learns its behavior from that and, and picks up its opinions from that. So something to be mindful of. Apple credit card, um, husband and wife, by the same tax returns, live in the same house, he gets 20 times her credit limit. Ring up Apple to ask why this happened and they can't explain it. We, we do not know, but we know that we don't have gender bias was what the, the answer was. But, you know, we have to go back to, can you tell me why? And this is back to the point of explainability. Um, this is a very sad case. I'm not going to go into the Instagram one, which I've actually spoken wrong, and social media, but, you know, it was a very sad case in England. Um, a teenager doing self harm it ended up in a very tragic situation, and it turns out that they were being recommended self harm and similar posts. So recommendations are fantastic. I love them on Netflix. You know, they usually do quite good stuff. I want to watch, but you know, back to who is this recommending and what are you were recommending it for? So you know, there's guidelines there that we need to be more mindful of. The U.S. healthcare funding. I mean, this is actually a really interesting one because. I think in an effort not to be biased, <clears throat> they removed race from the, the data. What ended up happening was, so they decided they were going to uh, distribute the healthcare funding based on um, previous spending on healthcare. Now we can also share and think, oh, well, that's a great idea. But it turns out that the black, the African-American black people had actually spent less money on healthcare, And it was the white people who traditionally had all the money. So they spent more money in healthcare. So when it came to divvying up the money on the healthcare, it interpreted it that the African-Americans didn't need the money because they had spent less money. And it ended up that the, they had to be sicker to get the same care that the white person did. You know, omissions of data can be just as bad as actually having it built into the data. Amazon CV recruitment, uh, you know, they based it on the last 10 years of CVs and their top talent they had in. You all know tech is a male dominant uh, industry. So it ended up really that females ended up being biased out of and uh, knocked out of the, the top talent and CV sorting because they weren't similar to the top talent that they already had in there, which is, was male. And then the Netherlands child care benefit, AI actually put down the government. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, very interesting. It was a, a case where there was a, an error in the algorithm. Wasn't a huge amount of human uh, interaction in there. And basically, people ended up in massive debt because they had to repay back some of their child care benefits that was paid to them because the algorithm falsely identified them as being fraud or that they were not deserving of this. So it ended up being like a pretty sad case and it ended up that the AI got, the government ended up having to leave on the back of this. So, so these are all the disasters that go wrong. So like, you know, have a think about what you're developing. I, algorithms are amazing. I think the work that's going on in AI, but we do need to think a little bit broader and think outside of, of, of how we're going to actually code those algorithms. So what would the EU uh, suggest for kind of how we're going to build uh, trustworthy AI? So we're trustworthy, you know, that we believe in it, we can trust it, and we want to use it. Again, human agency and oversight, you know, we want to make sure that we back that human autonomy uh, principle, that we want it to be, you know, for the people we're supporting and giving them the autonomy to make the decisions. 
but it's not just about coercing them and manipulating them into our opinion. Um, again, we talk about a little bit about oversight, human in the loop, human on the loop, and human in command. They're kind of very different options that's there, but you know, there is a human oversight that needs to be uh, accountable throughout this. And, you know, I think when Gardy touched on, you know, um, explainable AI, like, you know, and a question came up about, you know, can it be used in drugs? I think every area needs to be able to explain it. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. If you're making decisions through AI, you need to stand over and understand those decisions that's been made. It's obviously very difficult with the neural networks we have in place, et cetera, but you know, it is something that we have to be accountable for. Technical robustness and safeness. So again, you know, uh, wrench and apart, you know, we also have to be resilient to attacks. You know, we talk about the transparency. There's actually a, an element of transparency when you think about if we make it too transparent, are we actually opening it up to attacks? So is it easier to hack us? So, you know, there's a little bit of a trade-off there, but something that we need to, to be mindful of accuracy, we need to kind of look at this. And I think a lot of this needs to be done throughout the entire life cycle. And we talk about this as well, like when, when it's released and it's out in the market, are we constantly monitoring it? There's new data coming in. Is the new data throwing what the, the results are now and they're still the results we want? So this life cycle is repeatable. It has to be done throughout all stages and even after it's released. And again, you know, reliability and producibility, constant monitoring. We need to be ensured that we're comfortable that it is reliable and staying with the same results that we would expect. We talk about privacy and, and data governance. You know, Gary, we touched on the GDPR, one of the, the most crucial, I think, uh, uh, elements that came out of the EU in the last couple of years, and certainly in terms of people's privacy. If anybody's following the case of uh, Graham Dwyer, um, you know, he's got an appeal up in the, the high court. Well, he's actually got the European court on, and I think he won it, as far as I understand. But, um, you know, we are not allowed to retain data for longer than six months unless the person has a reason to have it kept. Now, his data ended up being kept. He had no reason for that data to be kept. He was not being flagged by the Gardaí or the authorities. So that data ended up being kept, or, like, unacceptably according to GDPR. So that's kind of where the appeal is coming from. And, uh, you know, we also have to stand over the quality of our data and the governance of our data. Do you have bias built into your data? Can you justify that you don't have bias built in there? Um, you need to watch out for inaccuracies. I talked already about the omissions of data. You know, it ended up being, a, you know, the wrong decision to omit some data. And then, you know, access to the data as well. It has to be very controlled. Are you know, disguising the data? Are we kind of economizing it or et cetera? And then we talk about transparency. Again, you know, I've got a huge amount on it, but auditability is going to be one of the big things. If you're going to be working in high risk, you need to be in a position to have your code and audited, your results audited, and understand those results. Uh, traceability, you know, if a mistake happens, can you explain why the mistake happened and what you're going to do to correct it? And as part of this, we talk a little bit maybe about communication as well. Um, do the end users know that the decision has been made by AI? And according to the EU, we believe that that person needs to know that the decision made on their behalf was by AI. Um, discrimin look, you know, diversity, non-discrimination and fairness, they're probably pretty obvious here, but avoidance of unfair bias, you know, historic data in there, incompleteness of data, are we introducing uh, bias in our algorithms? Uh, something just to, to kind of notice. And then um, we also talk about the accessibility and universal design. It's not a one size fits all. We have to think about the people who, who have disabilities, who don't have the same access as maybe everybody sitting here today. You know, can we design a system that everybody can use? And I think maybe we need to adjust the systems if they don't. And then the final part would be stakeholder participation. You know, at the end of the day, who is using this AI? Who is using these algorithms? Can you involve them in the decision making and that's the right solution? If we look back to the healthcare situation, if we had involved different diverse groups in that, would it have been noticed? Open question for you to, to maybe just have a think about. We talk about societal and environmental well-being. The UN has sustainable goals. At the end of the day, I suppose we, we want to be constantly supporting those. 
we want to build AI that is going to be in place and build a bit of future for our for the next generation to come, our children, our children's children. Do you think that like our grandchildren won't have an environment or a, a good society because of the decisions we make now? And so I am pretty close to the end. And the last one is accountability. Again, audibility. Uh, redress, again, we kind of touched on a lot of this, but, you know, minimizing and reporting negative, uh, negative results, negative impacts, and redress, taking the stand up and accepting that. Uh, that's, that's what we're going to do wrong. So, um, and I mentioned already that, you know, the law does come into effect in, in 2003, and um, probably more likely that it'll have to be complied by in 2024 and again you know the white house has released there a little bit behind us so we'd be expecting that everybody's working for like u.s kind of based companies we will have to be following the guidelines for that for the u.s based ones in kind of 2025 onwards um if you're going to take anything from this today um you know i hope you did enjoy it but you know i think you need to realize who is using the system who's your end users and try and put yourself in that foot. We always say as well, you know, we talked about minority groups. We talked about, you know, Vicky supporting inclusion and, you know, women in tech. For us to really assess what the end result is, we do need a diverse group in there looking at that because they represent a different group than, than the other person sitting here. So that was my uh, very brief and uh, one on AI. I'm not an expert by any means mm -hmm. at all. Uh, it's just something I took an interest in and I kind of just follow up and I study in it in my spare time, uh, not through work. So, um, but I just thought it was very important and I think it's very interesting all the stuff that's going on in the world. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's really important because we, we've been talking about all these concepts um, the past few years and as long as you don't have something really complete uh, a process then you can look at one aspect and, and completely miss the others and there's so many aspects actually it's a bit overwhelming you wonder actually can you is it actually possible to build an, a model that that fits all these criteria and now i think we were missing and I, I know that we're kind of at the end of it there is a high level expert group an artificial intelligence that was put together and they put together an ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. I do think it's worth reading. There's an assessment list at the end and it asks you the questions. If I had time, I was going to ask you the questions, but there is a list there of a couple of hundred questions and those questions you can ask yourself. And I think that they do make you think a little bit differently yeah. rather than the best solution. We have to think about the best solution for society and for people and for our end users. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess we can take one or two more questions. So I think the, one of the things I'm always curious about is like understanding responsibility in the context of these conversations. Um, and so there's always a, a lot of shared language here, but it's really hard to define scopes of responsibility and their responsibility in terms of terms of unintended consequences or where you know, or in terms of like the uh, negative implications, right? Um, and so like. As you as you think about like you know um, the life cycle of production of AI as models from like academic research to the deployment within a company to like you know its use usage by end users, uh, if something goes wrong, how do you define you know um, one where the responsibility what lie and how do you hold you know how do you actually have accountability around that? Then two from the context of I guess like you know um, in your your position as a as a um, as a senior leader within a large multinational company, right? Like how much of uh, how much of your purview or what you think is um, ethical or and transparent and respond um, and, and fair and like all these conversations you think about how much of that is uh, constrained by your legal liability and so like are you you know um, is there incentives that make it hard for you know for uh, you know um, policymakers and, and decision makers within large companies to actually you know do something that would be you know uh, ideally responsible but it might create like a larger surface area of liability and so it's hard to make sure you know do the right thing in that context so sorry that's like a super complication no, no 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 and look i think the responsibility there's a a joke in the industry that we look for one neck to choke but uh 
obviously we're not uh, using that today for AI, um, but it's more, I do think as a team, that, that the team is responsible, but you know, it's not a leader. I think everybody makes a decision together. Um, I think if there was a legal action, I think the company would have to stand up and take responsibility as a company. It wouldn't be down to the programmer wrote this. At the end of the day, the programmer is one cog in a cycle. Um, everybody, and that's back to the human in the loop, the human in command, there has to be people there monitoring. I think, again, back to our diverse groups, are we comfortable with what's going out there? Do we think we're representing what's right? And I think at the end of the day, we have to be down to our gut feeling that we're doing what's ethically right. Um, I'm not sure there's always going to be an answer. There's going to be trade-offs all the time. Uh, we're always going to have trade-offs between one or the other. But I think we ultimately have to stand over our decision of why we chose to go down that route. If there is redress, we have to stand up and take that. Um, but I think at the end of the day, when you look mm -hmm. at the decision that was made, can that diverse group, the humans that have involved along the way, support the decision and the answers that's coming out of that? And if we all feel it's the right thing, you know, ethically, we think that it was the thing that should have happened. Um, your second question, uh, uh, you know, I, I think might have been back to, are we being held back? At the end of the day, the EU don't want innovation, you know, but I think we have to go back to human rights. You know, we cannot be causing harm. So some of the things are like, I work probably more in trading and, and going down to the stock market. So um, we might be supporting, you know, traders, helping them make a better decision on their investing. So, you know, financially it could have consequences, but at the end of the day, the AI does not click that approved button to buy the stock. You know, it's the human that makes the decision. It's a recommendation. It's up to you whether you want to buy it or not. That's your choice. Um, but it's a human that ultimately makes the decision. And I think that is important in terms of accountability. So, I'm not sure I've answered every one of your questions. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, fair. I think the, the, we are going to second question more about um, the choices you make when you're trying to uh, implement other monitoring or implement ways to kind of um, ensure that the, the systems you deploy are fair and, and, uh, and, and uh, transparent, right? So, like, in one of the legal cases you mentioned, I think part of the reason why maybe the US healthcare is the reason you take out you know race explicitly is that it's a it's a you know it's a it's a legal vector for someone to attack you and say, oh, you know, um you have uh, you know violations against uh, you know certain um, uh, uh, certain federal regulations about you know uh, racial considerations as to whether you you know provide loans or not. Uh, and so oftentimes some people will sort of will willfully, you know, um, not choose to have you know uh, certain types of monitoring in place because it limits your liability. And so, like on one hand, you know it's kind of like if you're willfully ignorant, then like you don't know what you don't know. But then that leads into the problem where like you have these unintended consequences happening because you're not actually thinking about that in the first place. And and I would ask then, did you have the diverse group at the end reviewing the results out of that? That did you have a representation for each group there that could actually say, well, look, you know what, I I've noticed that this is not happening in the group I'm involved in. You know, I think sometimes to see a result, you need to be in that person's shoes. Um, I don't think it's going to fully answer it, but I think you know, at the end of the day, the decision was made to remove race. No, look, I, I'm assuming that's what happens, but the race was not involved in it, and that's how the decision was made. But it was done out of trying to be good. You know, the decision was made so that they wouldn't introduce bias and, and the omission actually, well, it equally probably caused it. You know, if it was left in, it might have caused it, or maybe actually it would have brought more attention to it. I actually worked with this guy and he's African-American and um, he he said to me that, you know, we were joking about the, the CV sorter and he had mentioned that, you know, if his race had not been included, he does not think he'd be in that job today because typically it might hire from the higher end universities. And the fact that he was African American, it actually allowed and said, you know what, this person probably is from a low, lower kind of social economic environment, so they don't have the financials to go to the same colleges. So they ended up getting in anyway, and but they didn't come from one of the high ends. So you know, sometimes including race can actually be a benefit to the people there. And he had said if it had been omitted. You know, if it hadn't, if he had been omitted that he was that, he actually doesn't think he'd be there today. So I think it's trying to balance it and trying to be fair. And we'll never always get it right. And there will always be trade-offs. But I think if you're trying to do it, I think if you do it out of the right place, then you can stand over that. But I look at, I'm, I'm telling you now, I'm not an expert. This is my opinion. So just kind of highlight that as a disclaimer. <laughs>
Um, I think everyone online was uh, were saying that it was really interesting. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Towards the end, um, we're a little bit over time, but I think Brendan wanted to say something. <laughs> Just a few brief words on behalf of uh, the Data Science Institute. Um, the talks here were really fantastic, such a range from very thought provoking by parents to inspirational with high ladies. So th this was very good. So I'd like to thank the actual speakers themselves, so, uh, Samira, our own uh, Garji, Shiki, and Karen. Thank you, the audience, both here and online. Uh, thank uh, Caroline, who's been a great and wonderful friend to all things IT in terms of building through IT, a sense of community within the IT sector for so long and sponsoring events like this. And the committee and volunteers had uh, made all this happen. And I mentioned it by name, I think they, they deserve that. Cecile, Priya, Samara G, Huda, Sveti, Daria, John, and Alex. So tonight was very important. You were part of, of a change in Galway tonight. For three years, the whole public engagement in terms of science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths has been relatively dormant because of COVID. So after three years, we have restarted Go with Science and Technology uh, Festival in the Flesh. And there is a great enthusiasm for it after three years, 2019 um, uh, was the last, and we started again on Sunday, and this is part of two weeks. The rest of the country has one week of science technology uh, celebration. We have two weeks and go in and have for years. We had 14,000 people in one building alone on Sunday. They went through the Lady Allen, 20,000 plus on the campus. So these events are part of increasing mm -hmm. awareness. And DSI from uh, Insight and its predecessor during next uh, uh, year, it, it's only two months old, so we're celebrating 20 years. And what we have done now tonight is the restart of what Insight and DSI had before COVID. We have tried to develop an open door policy, inviting people in from right across the IT sector and beyond. And tonight is the restart of that within this actual building, open door policy, trying to develop a community and make this an IT or a digital hub. So tonight I was working inside in the computer museum that we're reopening to the public on Saturdays from the uh, 26th. Tonight we have the data science, women in data science here, and we want to continue that. Before COVID, we had the Digital Makers Club here, we had Coder Dojo, uh, we had a series of a huge amount of school tours coming in of all ages, uh, promoting the research that's taken here, place here, and tonight, the, the key issues for me was respect, equality, diversity, and community. And that's what we're trying to do right across. So we don't work in isolation from the rest of the community of Galway and beyond. We're trying to uh, make that connection real at those particular levels. So um, I particularly work in areas like internet safety and cyberbullying. I started that in 2004, when very few was doing through the work here. The biggest victims to me online are teenage girls um, in issues of pornography, violence, and so on and so forth. And these have to be raised. So Karen, you raised some very, very important issues that have to be talked about, discussed, and tackled. You know, So to me, uh, and to the people here in DSI, the, the volunteers, yourselves, and the speakers, were all part of reaching out to the community, developing a sense of, of, of equality, respect, and community, and using technology for the good so when you leave tonight, if you have time, maybe not tonight, but later on, we have a section dating back 10 years of, of women in technology, the hidden histories, people that were airbrushed out of the history books. Women only went to the universities, the great universities of Cambridge and Oxford in the 20s. They only got degrees in the 20s right here. Women actually only got to vote in Switzerland in about 1970. So things have changed a lot, but a lot more has to be done. And we have a section on, uh, on women in terms of comic culture and how they were treated over the years itself, you know? So I thank everybody for being here. I particularly thank the speakers and the volunteers. So hopefully this is the start of something bigger and better, but it has to start somewhere. It started tonight. So thank you all for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. I think I didn't have to say this. <laughs>
So yeah, again, we're uh, it's it's really kind of a launch, but so we're we're still figuring out uh, where we want to go, and it's also that's also why we wanted this event to start a connection with people and see what um, what are people interested in and what can we build together um, as a community. So it's very open to uh, evaluation as well, and uh, we're really happy to to see uh, such a, a nice turnout, especially. In the dark nights and <laughs> a little bit outside of the city so uh we really appreciate uh, every one of you for coming and all the uh, speakers and all the people online obviously thank oh. you sorry thank you.